Hi everybody, my name's Hannah Mackay Tate and I'm a tour guide here in Edinburgh in Scotland. Obviously, this being 2020, we don't have a lot of tourism going on right now, so I thought I would take you on a little virtual tour of one of my favourite places in Edinburgh, Holyrood Park behind me here. We are so lucky to have a place like this in the middle of the city centre, this huge 259 hectare park. The park itself is a scheduled monument. It has eight listed buildings in it, over a hundred archeological sites and two sites of special scientific interest. So I just could not be happier to get to show you around one of my most loved spots in Edinburgh. And you're not even gonna to have to climb any hills to come with me. So without further ado, let's get going. So I wanted to start by talking to you about some of the geological history of the park and how we ended up with these amazing landscapes that we can see behind me here. We really have to go back about 350 million years in order to reach the start of this story, when there were volcanoes active in this area. So this hill behind me, this is Arthur's seat here, this was an active volcano 350 million years ago and a lot of the landscape we see is a result of that activity. This hill behind me would actually have been twice as big at the time of its eruption. So over millions of years, it's eroded away into the shapes we see today. And that would include glaciers shaping the landscape and just general weather over 350 million years. Famously, we have quite a lot of weather in Scotland, so it's had time to work its magic. The other main element of the landscape of the park that you see when you walk in are these cliffs behind me here. These are Salisbury Crags. And these are really, really important in the history of geology, as well as being just a cool feature to look at. Back in the 18th century, a guy called James Hutton, who's sometimes known as the father of modern geology, discovered what he called an unconformity in the rocks here. Now he studied rocks all over Scotland, so these ones aren't necessarily unique, but they are part of the story of him figuring out that the earth wasn't thousands of years old, but millions of years old. What he spotted was some younger rocks intruding inside some older rocks. And suddenly he began to realise that the earth must be ancient. He really was coming up with the concept of what we would now call deep time. So he looked at this and he realised that time had, as he put it, no vestige of a beginning and no prospect of an end. Now that was a really controversial idea in the 18th century when people thought that all of the rocks in the world had been created by one big flood a few thousand years ago. So this was really revolutionary. And without James Hutton's ideas about how big time really is, we would never really have come to understand the world and even the universe as we do today. So we're not just looking at some pretty rocks, we're looking at a really important part of geological history. So let's move on and learn a little bit about human habitation in the park. We're now around on the other side of Arthur's Seat, which you can still see behind me here, and we're up on top of Dunsapi Crag, one of the smaller hills in the park. So we'll just do a little rotation so you can kind of see the view behind me here. And the reason I came up here to talk about humans in the park is that we know that people used to live on top of this hill about 2,000 years ago. Now, people have probably been in this landscape for at least 7,000 years because we found old stone and flint tools here that tell us that. But we know for sure that by 2,000 years ago, people were living here. And we had at least four of what we call hill forts in the park, kind of fortified villages. One up on top of Arthur's Seat, one up on top of Salisbury Crags, one on a place called Samson's Ribs, and one up here on Dunsapi Crag. I think there's something kind of amazing about standing on top of this rock and knowing that 2,000 years ago, there were people living up here in a village. Now we have this tendency to think of people from the past as being really different from us, and they were in a lot of ways, their lives were very different from ours, but they were still people. Even 2000 years ago, they loved each other, they made art, they told stories, they worried about where their next meal was going to come from, they worried about getting sick or losing family members. I think it's important that we remember that 2000 years ago, the people who lived here were a lot more like us than they were unlike us. Behind me, on the hill here, you might be able to make out some kind of ripples in the landscape. It's a little bit bright to see them here. But on that hill behind me, there would have been farming. 
And we know that people were farming here by about 800 years ago, back in the Middle Ages, but the terraces that we can still see in the landscape today are maybe as old as 2,000 years from when people lived in the hill forts here in Holyrood Park. So when we look around us in the landscape, yes, we're seeing things from hundreds of millions of years ago, and from hundreds of years ago, but we're even seeing things from thousands of years ago of people living in this landscape and appreciating a lot of the same things about it that we love today, I'm sure. So let's carry on making our way down from Dunsapy Crag and we'll go and look at the oldest remaining building that we can still see in the park today, St Anthony's Chapel. So, just over my shoulder right here, you should be able to see the ruins of St Anthony's Chapel, which is the oldest building that we can still see above ground in Holyrood Park today. It's so old, we don't actually know how old it is. We know that it was repaired in 1426 because there's a record of the Pope giving money for that to happen, so it must be older than that. But beyond that, nobody's really sure. Now you can see it's a ruin, but for hundreds of years, this was an important site of Christian worship in the park. And it was particularly associated with feast days to celebrate the cross and also with May Day, which is a time that has a lot of pagan associations as well. And you'll still hear sometimes of people coming to wash their face in the dew on Arthur's seat on May Day morning to obtain eternal youth. Now, as well as this little chapel up here, there were older Christian associations with the park. Behind me, eh, it's really tough to see from this kind of distance, but behind me we've got Holyrood Palace and Abbey. And that abbey was founded back in 1128 by a guy called King David I. According to the story, he was out here hunting in Holyrood Park with his men when he was gored by a stag. Now he prayed and his crucifix shot up into his hands and the stag vanished. Now David interpreted this as a miracle and he decided to found an abbey called the Abbey of the Holy Rood or Holy Rood Abbey, the Abbey of the Holy Cross. Now we have to take that story with a little pinch of salt because there's no record of it until 200 years after it allegedly happened and it's full of all of this kind of popular religious imagery of the period. But we do know that the abbey was founded around that time regardless of how it happened. Over the years, the little royal accommodations attached to the abbey developed into what we now know as Holyrood Palace. And that's been a royal residence for generations of royals in Scotland. If you go back to the 1500s, Mary Queen of Scots was in residence there and saw her assistant David Rizzio murdered by her husband in one of the palace's towers. Back in the 1700s, Bonnie Prince Charlie took it as his royal court during the Jacobite uprisings when he took Edinburgh. Back in the 19th century, Queen Victoria made it her official residence in Scotland, and that's what it still is for Queen Elizabeth II today. Normally, you would be able to visit Holyrood Palace, and honestly, I don't know when you're going to be able to do that again. But it is a fantastic building to look at, even just from the outside. So we'll come back and do a whole video just about Holyrood Palace. For now, let's say goodbye to St Anthony's Chapel, and we'll head downhill and have a look at some of the changes the Victorians made to the park in the 19th century. So before we finish up our tour and I go and have a lie down in the sunshine, because it is absolutely roasting, if you can't tell from how sweaty I've been every time we've stopped, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the Victorians and how they shaped the park into what we see it as today. So from about the 1850s onwards, after Queen Victoria started using Holyrood Palace as her residence, this became a recreational landscape. And prior to that, you would have had industry in the park, there was quarrying going on in the rocks, there were livestock grazing, crops being grown. But from the 1850s it turned more into the kind of landscape for leisure that we see around us today. As well as taking away industry and agriculture from this landscape, the Victorians, and specifically Queen Victoria and her husband Albert, made several improvements to the park. So they drained marshes, paths were put in, a new road was put in around the hill that you can still drive around today, known as the Queen's Drive. And they also put in this loch that you can see behind me here. This is called St Margaret's Loch. You might be able to make out all of the swans that it's famous for swimming around on its surface at the moment. And it's named after King David I's mum, by the way, St Margaret. That's where that name comes from. So still really associated with the area. Now this whole park is still royal land. You'll sometimes hear it called the Queen's Park or the King's Park, as it would have been called when we had a king as well. 
But in essence, it is public land. There are restrictions on things like running a business inside the park uh, or bringing commercial vehicles through, and they can close the roads to traffic, but there are no gates to shut pedestrians out at any time. So this is a landscape that exists for all of us. We can all come and enjoy this beautiful place in the city centre and I have always appreciated having it, but I never appreciated it as much as I've appreciated it these past few weeks. Having somewhere that is so like the countryside, so peaceful, so open, something that feels like it belongs to all of us. I think that is something we have all needed to have in these past few weeks of lockdown. So I feel extremely fortunate to live so close to this beautiful place and to be able to share it with you as well. I hope you've enjoyed our little tour of Holyrood Park. I would love to see you come and explore it yourself when we're able to move around and go and have some more adventures once again. So hopefully we'll see you back in Edinburgh one day soon. Um, and if not, drop a comment down below and let me know what you'd like to hear about Edinburgh or el elsewhere in Scotland um, as I make some more videos to keep myself occupied in this weird, weird time. Bye!